Good morning. Welcome to Aviano Baptist Church's virtual service. My name is Barry Cole, the pastor here at ABC, and we are a church that exists for one reason, and that is that we can come to love Jesus more and lead others to come to love him. And regardless of what your background is or what you do or don't know about Jesus, we want you to know that you're welcome here. And though we can't see you this morning, and because we are virtual, it would be easy for you to slip in and slip out uh, and go completely unnoticed. We want you to reach out. Let us know how we can help you get connected so that together we can grow in our relationships with Jesus and see the difference that he can make in each of our lives. So I invite you to join us. Let's spend the next couple of minutes digging into God's word together. Now, this is the ninth Sunday that we've not been able to meet together. And of course, the situation's unfolding. You see the notes on Facebook as continued decrees are coming out from the Italian government. Uh, and, as, and as those continue to come out, we're going to be looking at the best ways for us to minister. Tomorrow, Monday, uh, on base, there's going to be another town hall meeting, and they'll talk about some of the changes to the latest decree. And so depending on what is or is not said about church services at that uh, town hall meeting, the church council is going to be meeting this coming week, and we're going to be discussing any changes that we might have to make to how we're conducting our services, how we're conducting our home groups, how we can be here to minister and to reach out to this community. So there will be more to follow on that in the coming week. Now this morning, we're going to continue in our lesson series, uh, the lessons from lockdowns, uh, as we're looking at biblical lockdowns to see what the Word of God has to say to us. And so if you've got a Bible with you this morning, and I hope that you do, or a Bible app on your device, uh, take it out and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. And by the way, let me just remind you that our church service is available as an event in version. So if you are a version user, uh, go ahead and log in there. You'll find today's passage. Uh, you'll also find the announcements. Um, and then I mentioned on Facebook that starting next week, I'm going to be resuming using the note-taking guides. They'll be available as a downloadable uh, there on you version as well. Now we look here in in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He wrote this letter while he was in prison, and so we could find a lot of lockdown lessons for us as we look through this letter. But I just want us to focus on Ephesians chapter one, particularly Paul's prayer uh, as he's in prison. Now Paul's prison prayers, as they've been called, uh, show up in four places. Uh, they show up twice in Ephesians, uh, once here in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Uh, they show up over in Ephesians chapter 3, another prayer of his, verses 14 to 21. Uh, they show up in another one in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, uh, and then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 12. Jean and I just got back from the States this past Sunday. And I've been jokingly saying, since we're on this time of quarantine, that we are under house arrest for these 14 days. But I want you to think about for a minute, what if that was really the case? What if you really were under house arrest? What do you suppose you'd be praying for if you were in captivity, if you were in prison? You might be praying for deliverance, right? Or you maybe we'd be praying for a good judge to hear our case or, or the strength to persevere during that time. But I invite you to take a look there in Ephesians chapter 1. Let's listen to Paul's prayer and just think about how that might differ from how you or I might pray in that circumstance. He says, For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in, in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of, his, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet 
and gave him his, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Would you pray with me for just a second? Father, we thank you uh, that you inspired Paul uh, to not only pray this way, but to write it down for us. And Lord, as we spend these next few minutes in your word, would you open the eyes of our hearts and enlighten us to the truth that you have for us? You can challenge us in this time of lockdown that our prayer lives could become more like Paul's. Father, would you just spend these next few moments leading us, and guiding us, and teaching us? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I mentioned last week, and particularly if you're new to Aviano Baptist, that I like to pull out what I call the big idea uh, for every passage that we're talking about. What is the main point that God has for us? And I think the, the big idea for this is we look at Paul's prayer here in Ephesians chapter 1. The big idea is this, that Paul's prayer is outwardly focused, and it's all about how God can best be glorified. And so for these next couple of minutes, we could spend literally hours and hours digging through this passage, but just like we did last week, I just want to pull out a few key thoughts and keep this message fairly brief. And so I want us to just take a, a few minutes and just look at what are some of the lessons that we can learn about how to pray in this time of isolation. The first thing I want us to think about is this, is that Paul prays outwardly. Think about your own prayer life. And I challenge you to, to think intentionally to pray outwardly, particularly in these times. Look there again at verses 15 and 16. And, and as you glance over them, as, as you read them, there's, there's this intimate, personal feeling to the, to the beginning section, per, certainly, of this prayer. I can't help but to notice how many times he uses the word you or your. Seven times I counted in that passage. And I've mentioned before, if you want to find a key thought, what is a main idea God's trying to get across to us in a passage? Look for a word that is repeated. And we have this idea, this intimate, personal connection, this feeling of Paul's. And he mentions there in, in verse 15 that he has heard of their faith. And I think that's, that's remarkable. Most scholars think that Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter. And if you got on Google Maps today and you just put in from Rome to Ephesus, the distance between those two cities, if you took a boat or you took an airplane, is about 800 miles. And that's significant. We have to remind ourselves that there was no Facebook in those days. There was no email. There was no WhatsApp that Paul could just jump up on the internet and find out what was going on. And the fact that he knew about their faith, a city that was 800 miles from where he was, and the fact that he knew about their faith means that he went to great lengths to find out about them. Now think about us in these times of lockdown. And us as a church, what God has called us to be and to do here in this community, building connections and building community. Well, that's one of the, the key things that God's called us to do as a church at Aviano Baptist, but for every believer. And I mentioned the church council is going to be meeting to discuss some of the ways that we can do that more effectively corporately. But let me ask you to think about this. How are you doing that personally? As I was watching the town hall this past week, they had a section where they were talking about the shout outs. And I heard many of our church members that were, that were giving shout outs to other people, other agencies on base that were doing things. And I couldn't help but to think, how well are we doing as the body of Christ, as the family of God here in this community? How well are we doing reaching out and intentionally connecting to other people? And so I challenge you to this week intentionally reach out to at least one family. See how they're doing. See how you can pray for them. Paul's prayers were, were very much outwardly focused. And the other thing about his prayer, though, is that it's marked by thanksgiving. Did you notice again what he said in verse 16? He said, I do not cease giving thanks. It wasn't a one-off thing. For Paul, thanksgiving was a regular part of how he prayed. Crisis times like this can 
can make us turn inward. And that's not all bad. There is a lot of focus on the family time that's going on right now because we're looking inward. There's a lot more time we're spending in personal and spiritual fitness because we're looking inward. It's not all a bad thing. But if we're not careful, that inward look can have a tendency to bring out our inherent selfishness, almost drive us toward an every man for himself kind of mindset. But you know what Thanksgiving does for us? It helps us to look outward. It helps us to look upward. It helps us to keep a positive outlook and a positive attitude. So let me encourage you during this time, think about your prayer life. Is it outwardly focused? Make a list of those people that you have to be thankful for, those things that you have to be thankful for. Lift those people up. Lift those things up in a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. Mentioning not only what you have to be thankful for, but the needs in those people's lives. We look at Paul's prayer in isolation, his prayer in captivity, and we see that it's inherently outwardly focused. But not only that, pray that your prayers would be outward, but pray also that you'd grow in Christ. That God would use this time for his glory to grow us all in a, in a closer relationship with him. Look there again at verse 17. And he's praying for their spiritual growth. And I just think how amazing that is. How amazing a person, an example, the Apostle Paul is. That he's in the midst of this. He's in prison. Now, the Roman government had absolute authority to execute him at the end of this. He didn't know how this was going to turn out. He might have been released. He might have been acquitted. He might have been executed. But in the midst of that, his thought is on the spiritual growth of those believers in Ephesus. I just find that absolutely amazing. And he prays specifically that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, as believers, God has already given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, his Holy Spirit, deposited in each of us. He mentions that just a few verses before as a, as a down payment on the inheritance that God has for us. He's already giving us, given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so he's not praying that God would give them something they don't already have but that he would enable their spirit, little s, spirit, to be interested in the wisdom and the revelation that God brings into their lives. You've heard this before. We, we've talked about it several times. You spend any time in church, you've, you've heard this talked about, that one of the ways that God helps us grow is by revealing our weaknesses in the midst of adversity, through adversity, over in James chapter 1, James says this. He says that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And that word perfect there doesn't mean how we use it in English to mean flawless. It means full, complete, mature is what it means. And that often comes because of adversity, because of testing that comes into our lives. Many of you parents have become homeschool teachers during this time. And whether you ever saw yourself as a homeschool family or not, this time of lockdown and the schools being closed has forced many families to become homeschool families. Now, as a, as a homeschool teacher, from time to time, you may have to administer a test. And the purpose of that test is not to make your children's lives miserable, although that's probably what they think it is. The purpose of that test is to reveal the strengths and the weaknesses of the education process. The strengths and weaknesses of your children as students and maybe you know, of, the, of the lessons and of the teaching, but to reveal the strengths and weaknesses. And God does that for us in tough times. He reveals things through us through adversity, through the testing that comes into our lives. And as God's Spirit reveals things to our spirit, 
the prayer is that we would have the wisdom to act on whatever it is he's revealing. And so let me ask you this, as you consider your time here in lockdown, what are the strengths and weaknesses in your character, in your relationship with God? What are those strengths and weaknesses that God's revealed to you during these times? And then how will you lay them before them? What will you do about them to use this time to grow in Christ? Paul's prayer is outwardly focused. His prayer is that they grow in Christ. And then the last thing for us to think about this morning is pray that you'd experience him more fully. That's what he's talking about, verses 18 through 23, that they would experience Christ more fully in their lives. We've sung the song in church. You've heard it many times, maybe the song, The Heart of Worship by Matt Redmond. I'm coming back to a heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. And the, the song begins like this. It says, when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come. You know, sometimes God allows everything to be stripped away so that we just simply come. No distractions, no competition, just us before him. And that's happened now, right? We have had a lot of things stripped away, a lot of freedoms that we didn't have before. That we had before, but they're stripped away, and we don't have them now. We don't have all the abilities to go where we want. Maybe our favorite restaurant, that's been stripped away. All of those things, that's happened to us right now. And Paul prays that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. Again, not that God would give them something they don't already have, but that with every fiber of their being, that they would recognize and apply what it is that God has brought into their lives, the fullness that Christ brings to us. And I just want to mention, pull out those three things he mentioned specifically. And I'm not going to preach a, another sermon within the sermon, but I just want to touch on these, these three things he mentions, that the, the eyes of their heart would be open to understand these things, the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, the greatness of his power. Hope is a powerful thing. We can live with the loss of just about anything. We, we've just talked about some of the things that have been stripped away now, some of the things we've lost because of the, the coronavirus situation. And as human beings, we, we can adjust and we can live with the loss of just about anything except hope. If hope is gone, all is lost. And he calls us specifically to be reminded, to recognize and apply the hope of his calling in our lives. And we could talk a lot about his calling and all the things that the word of God has to say about it. But the hope of his calling reminds us that our hope is entirely Christ-centered. When things get hard, when everything is turned upside down, when, when, when you're finding a, having a hard time finding a place to grab a hold of, do you still have hope? And if your hope is in horses and chariots, if it's in one day the cloud of the coronavirus passing, then I'll have hope. If your hope is in those things or any of the things of this world, we often find it hard to maintain and to have hope. But if our hope is in the hope of his calling, if it's, if it's centered in Christ and who he is in our lives, when our hope is in him, as Paul reminded the church in Rome, that hope does not disappoint. The second thing he mentions is the riches of his glory. And I just want us to notice again how he says it. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In us, his inheritance in us. Now, the idea of an inheritance, it makes us look to the future, the riches of his glory in his future in us. God is inherently future oriented in our lives. We often live our lives in the past, though, even as believers. We think of all the reasons that God shouldn't use us. <laughs> 
the mistakes that we've made, the failures that we've experienced. And we have this long list of all the reasons why God couldn't use us or shouldn't use us. And you know what? All those things are right. God knows about every one of those mistakes. He knows about every one of those failures. And yet, he has an amazing, glorious future for every one of us. And the prayer is that especially during this time, when the music has stopped and faded, the noise has settled down, that you pray that God would help you to accept the freedom from your past that you have in him. Those mistakes that, that we often hold ourselves back with. That we'd accept his freedom that he gives us from the past and make yourself available for his glorious future. And then the third thing that Paul mentions is the greatness of his power. You know, as I think about this coronavirus, I can't help but to think that this tiny little microscopic thing, you can't even see it with the naked eye, has brought every nation, every military, every economy, has brought every nation around the world to its knees. The, the best, smartest, most educated doctors in the world at the World Health Organization, the CDC, they're absolutely baffled. They're scrambling, pay, playing catch-up to this tiny little microscopic enemy. But you know, God hasn't been rendered powerless by the coronavirus. He says in verse 20, he reminds us that, that he and he alone has power over life and death. Verse 21, he reminds us he is far above all of the authorities of this world, both current and to come. And then verse 22, that all things, even the coronavirus, are subject to him. We've all got a little extra time right now. During this lockdown, maybe you're work on, on one week, off one week at work, and we all have a little extra time. So let me encourage you to take a few minutes during this time to just take a quick inventory. Have you been living in the fullness of Christ or have you simply been living in the here and now? Now, just like I did last week, I'm going to put up a few discussion questions on Facebook so that you and your family can, can take this passage and sit down around it and spend a little more time in it sometime during the course of the week. And I pray that you have a wonderful, blessed week. And we will put out any word uh, about changes that are coming as a result of tomorrow's town hall meeting. And if there's anything you need, you need someone to pray with you. You need to talk with someone about your relationship with Christ. You need someone to help with child care so that you can go grocery shopping. Someone to come mow your lawn. If there's anything that you need, would you contact me at pastor at avianobaptist.church? Contact me, contact any of our deacons. We'll be glad to come and help in any way that we can. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday.